So first of all, thank you everyone for coming and welcome to Leaving No One Behind the Sustainable Development Goes in LGBTI Populations, which is part of Out Talks, which is a weekly conversation that we have at Outright with experts about different LGBTI issues. And if you'd like, please check our Out Talks webpage and you can see every Wednesday we have a different conversation on a different topic. I know we're all tired of webinars, but I promise they're as good as this one with this wonderful panelists. Um, all of you saw the beautiful bios of our panelists and I cannot make them justice. So I'm just gonna introduce themselves them quickly and then I'm gonna give them space to introduce themselves. But I just wanna use my moderator privilege and you're gonna hear that throughout the hour that I am gonna use my moderator privilege a lot um, to say a couple of words of why we're having this panel today. Um, we're in a very horrific moment with the global pandemic and everything that has been happening. And we all know that when the pandemic hit, we saw that LGBTI populations were left behind and they continue to be left behind. We were already in a very harsh situation that the 2030 agenda and the SDGs were not gonna be met by 2030. And then when we got hit by a global pandemic, everything got even worse. So when we're having this conversation is because we can look at the pandemic on everything that is happening, the lack of access for our vaccines, the lack of access for health services and everything else. But we can also see it as an opportunity to make the SDGs follow their promise to not leave anyone behind, especially those who are furthest left behind, such as the LGBTI populations. So this is an opportunity and I have a lot of wonderful panelists here who are gonna give us a lot of ideas on how we can not only build that better, but how we can build that together and better. Because I think that's the most important thing. Uh, also, I wanna use this moment to do a little bit of advertising and ask everyone to go to the LGBTI stakeholder group website. I'm always trying to get us clicks um, as everyone here knows. The LGBTI stakeholder group is one of the major groups and other stakeholders. And we focus specifically on LGBTI populations. We have over a hundred organizations under the LGBTI stakeholder group. And we're so excited to welcome even more and to have more plural voices in the space. Outright is super proud to be one of the organizing partners. And some of those who are you're gonna hear today are also part of the LGBTI stakeholder group. So I'm also very proud of that. So you've, you've heard me a lot. And I'm just going to say their names and what they do. And then they're going to have time to tell us a little bit about the work, about their beautiful bios, and also how they incorporate LGBTI and develops development within their own work. Uh, we have Boyan Konstantinov from uh, UNDP. Boyan, I don't see you, but Boyan is a policy specialist with the HIV Health and Development Group of UNDP in New York focusing on key populations, LGBTI rights, and inclusive development. We have Almudena Rodriguez, who's advocacy coordinator at Association de Dreads Sexual y Reproductif, a Catalan feminist entity working, I hope I didn't butcher that, working on sexual reproductive rights of women and LGBTI people. We have Chris, who's an activist for queer rights and climate justice. And we also have Mauro Cabral Vispin, who is the executive director of GATE, Trans, Diverse, Gender, and Intersex Activism in Action. So I'm gonna pass the question to all of you to introduce yourselves and tell a little bit about the work that you do and how do you work at the intersection of LGBTI and development? And why don't we start with our youngest one, Chris, why don't we start with you? Good thing. Hi, Lisa. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Awesome. Well, hello to everyone. My name is Chris. I use they them pronouns. I consider myself non-binary and I'm an activist here residing in Mexico, in central Mexico, below Mexico City for the people that know it a little bit better. So most of the work that I do has to do with uh, the grassroots and trying to connect the grassroots with larger uh, international organizations. And oftentimes development is a really key piece in connecting that activism. Uh, not necessarily because it is the, the principle of what we do, but also because it's a really great tool to connect and create bridges between the voices of young people and uh, the agendas and the institutions at a wider level. So more specifically, the work that I do, I work with Weird Initiative, which is an initiative doing climate justice and doing climate education. I also do uh, work here in Mexico. I do work against uh, 
conventional therapy. I do work on climate justice and on getting us real climate policy in Mexico. So in Mexico, climate change is a really um, neglected issue. It is not an issue that is considered important. And even then, climate justice is not considered important. And as we know, uh, because of vulnerabilization and, and discrimination and general oppression, LGBTI people will suffer the climate crisis even greater. So we have to stand up for our rights. And we also have to be present in this space and know that um, this fight is not only to avoid danger from poor queer people, but also to demonstrate that queer people can do activism that is intersectional, that covers different topics, and also that is um, not that is unapologetic and that is clearly there, and that we're part of this agenda and of all of the agendas. So in that sense, the SDGs are an incredible tool, tool that young people can use and that we often use in order to communicate with, with governments, because it is at the end of the day an agreement and something that they have um, they themselves have committed to. So getting them to understand that this is your commitment and this is what we need as young people and the problems that you're not seeing. And it is here backed up by your own commitments creates a really great opportunity for collaboration and for change. Thank you so much, Chris. And that is true. Everything is interconnected and we have a lot of intersectionality in everything that we do. So I'm going to pass the same question to Boyan, who I see uh, on camera right now. Boyan, tell us a little bit about the amazing work that you do in the intersection of LGBTI and development. Thank you very much, uh, Louisa, and good morning and good afternoon to everyone around the globe who is attending this seminar. It's a pri privilege to be here. I'm, I'm honored and humbled to be um, among such distinguished panelists. Um, as uh, you can see from uh, the name that I, that I put, I work for UNDP, the United Nations Development Program. Um, I do policy work currently based in New York, and I work um, with uh, key populations most at risk of HIV and also in uh, LGBTI uh, rights and inclusive development. Um, so uh, I know that for LGBTIQ plus activists, uh, these two areas are um, a little bit strange read together. But if we have to be, um, if we have to be honest, this is how UNDP's engagement in uh, the LGBTIQ plus field um, started evolving because, as you know, uh, before the SDGs Agenda 2030 and the Leave No One Behind pledge, this engagement was quite challenging. So we used our mandate um, under the joint program, um, UN program on HIV and AIDS, UN AIDS, to engage with key populations and uh, work for access to justice and access to services for key populations with all the other um, UNAIDS co-sponsors. And consequently, in 2017, um, we uh, started uh, launching our programs um, working against violence and discrimination of LGBTI people. Previously in the UN parlance, it was uh, SOGI and then SOGI-esque, um, sexual orientation, uh, gender identity, and then sex characteristics were added. Um, and um, in uh, 2016, if I'm not mistaken, uh, how many are, I was it 13, UN entities um, subscribed to a join, join UN statement against violence and uh, discrimination against LGBTI people and also offering member states services to promote inclusion of LGBTI people and UNDP was one of them. So historically, our oldest and strongest perhaps program uh, in regions on LGBTI rights and inclusion is in Asia and the Pacific with uh, support from USAID, but also with uh, support from the Swedish government, um, with support also from uh, certain corporate entities, including the Economist event. Um, and this program has been going on since. Um, and uh, currently, it also addresses what Louisa mentioned in the beginning, um, the issues um, of uh, LGBTI youth and COVID-19, trying to um, facilitate to the extent possible 
uh, psychosocial services, support, mental health and well-being, particularly of young people, and also to promote uh, LGBTI youth entrepreneurship. Um, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, we currently do not have an active program. Um, we're building on something that we did uh, in the past, being LGBTI in Eastern Europe, which was a very small project. And um, <clears throat> it, uh, what it came up with among the all country reports was a report on um, what is it to be intersex. Um, it was started by a community member in, in, in Serbia, and we basically realized that we don't know anything. The report itself does not tell you much, but it actually put the issue on the table. So currently, UNDP is supporting the government of Albania to develop a more inclusive policy. And also, we are channeling our civil society partners requests from families that were generated after they uh, saw that such a report was, was released, because previously this uh, was something um, that was kept uh, secret. There was only one center uh, on the Balkans um, in uh, the countries of former Yugoslavia where there were trained physicians who would have a non-medicalizing approach to intersex children. So we hope that we'll be able to generate uh, interest and perhaps some funding as well to continue this important work. Um, being LGBTI uh, in the Caribbean is a program that is now in its um, um, I think fourth year, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, currently, the focus is obviously a lot on COVID-19, which, as everybody correctly mentioned, has disproportionately impact uh, our communities. Um, and otherwise, it focuses more on bridging the gap between government and civil society and using uh, UNDP's broad development mandate as an integrator to, to help uh, generate dialogue, and we hope to also expand uh, the program to Latin America, where uh, also there are quite a lot of um, activities that UNDP country offices do independently of the regional program. And last but not least, there is um, the project Inclusive Governance Initiative, which has just started, and it covers eight countries uh, in Africa. Um, and it builds on work that we have done in the past with USAID support and in partnership with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, and it focuses, uh, as the title says, on inclusive governance. So it is um, not necessarily built that much on the concept of human rights, but on the concept of acceptance and inclusion. And it's basically aiming at um, demonstrate uh, more about the work uh, activities um, of uh, LGBTI activists um, and uh, build a um, coalition of stakeholders, including government stakeholders that uh, are going to move the public perception uh, of what it is to be, uh, to be um, LGBTI, what it is to be queer, and to uh, rely on uh, the, the, the principles of tolerance and acceptance that exist in uh, societies in many countries uh, in Africa. Um, this project, as I said, is quite new, but now we're fully staffed and uh, we look forward to spreading our wings, so to say. I know that I, I'm speaking too long, so very quickly about the LGBTI Inclusion Index, which is a project that I manage at headquarters. And this is a project that is directly related to the SDGs because it focuses on um, inclusive uh, data collection, um, which uh, is aligned um, through 51 indicators that were developed with active participation of communities, including GATE, including uh, Outright Action International, for which we're very grateful. And this year, this index is going to be piloted. So this index is going to, this project is going to train statisticians and other officials that are in charge of collection to collect in a safe manner, disaggregated data. And all these indicators that um, I mentioned are aligned with the SDG target uh, indicators, because as we know, uh, whoever is counted counts, and we do not have globally disaggregated data for LGBTI communities. Here I stop, and thank you very much for your attention.
Boya, you never talk too much. We're here to learn about all these different things that all of you wonderful panelists are doing. So don't worry. Uh, we have time to talk more a little bit later. But I also would like Almudena for you to jump in and tell us a little bit about yourself and your work and everything that you've been doing. Okay, Lisa, thank you so much. It is very exciting for Women's Major Group to be present in this amazing webinar, and we're extremely grateful for this to Watch Right International. And so thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today sharing this space with all of you. So just to remind that we, Women's Major Group is a global inter intersectional feminist collective, and our main job is to facilitate and to support our members in the advocacy sustainable development processes, especially at regional at uh, global levels. Um, to answer the first question, um, there are several levels that LGBTIQ plus issues are relevant and related to the issues on gender equality and women's rights within the sustainable development understanding we, we have. Um, the first one, obviously, is the core causes of oppression of our constituencies, such as heteropatriarchy, mandatory heteronormativity, social constructed and stereotype gender roles is common to both our struggles. Also, we, because we are confronting the same structural and systematical barriers, and also we are confronting and resisting different kinds of violence because of our gender identities and expressions or our sexual orientations. Um, furthermore, from our intersectional feminist political position, we run away from the vision of a single essentialist political subject. And this point is crucial for us in order to ensure that we are inclusive and intersectional in our analysis, advocacy, and activism also. In addition, women's major group, we are very much human rights for Q's constituency. So we really believe all Agenda 2030 should be implemented from a human rights-based uh, perspective. We, can, we can't allow the rights of one group to be denied to try to move forward on our rights. A sustainable development work that does not take into, into consideration all of group is destined to leave someone behind. So we have to ensure all groups, including LGBTIQ plus uh, people, should be included in this work through their own voice and demands and our support in amplification of this. And, and now I would like to share with all of you some practical tool we have to incorporate LGBTIQ plus and development topics. For instance, um, in women's major group, we always try to emphasize in our documents, in our advocacy, that we are not only working to advance the rights and opportunity of women, but also girls and LGBTQ plus populations. Uh, for instance, we have a principles and values document that has to be signed if you would be a member of the women's major group. And this document ensures us for our, our members to realize that we are an inclusive group and no form of hate speech is accepted within women's major group. Um, for instance, in some summits, when it has been necessary, we have implemented security protocols and have built spaces in order our allies could work and could be heard. Um, that's why we, the, we say we demand system change. All the systems that oppress us violate our rights, such as heteropatriarchy, militarism, neoliberal capitalism, extractivism, are all inter, interlinked. And we can only change them toward a fire system if we work together. I stop here and, and later, come on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Almudena. And thank you so much for bringing um, together the LGBTI movement and the women's movement as they are mm. together and they cannot be separated. If we separate them, then 
it kind of looks a little bit weird because we all are fighting all these structural barriers and this strong causes that affect us all. And I want to call last but definitely not least to tell us a little bit about their bio and they've been doing. Mara, why don't you jump in? Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me and uh, on behalf of Gate to share this um, conversation with you. Uh, my name is Mauro, I am from Argentina, I am currently in Buenos Aires, and I'm the executive director of an organization called GATE. Uh, GATE is an international organization um, that is registered in the US, but actually our staff is located in different parts of the, of the world. In my case, uh, I am now, I am in, in, in Argentina due to COVID. Uh, we'll see what happens <laughs> later, this, later this year. And, and we work specifically on transgender diverse and, inter and intersex issues. Or, you know, we have another description, which is that we work on issues of gender identity, gender expression, and sex characteristics, which not necessarily are, you know, are the same as these uh, three populations. And GATE was founded by Justus Seyfield and myself in 2009, so it's been a long uh, time. Um, actually, many years ago, back in 2005, I was I used to work for the organization that now is outright international, and we got to organize, I think it's the longest ever training institute for trans and intersex activists from Latin America and the Caribbean. It was like two weeks institute for activists held here. In, in Argentina. So we have a, a long history uh, together. GATE work in different areas. We work on, on HIV issues. We work at the UN, especially in Geneva. We are part of the Equal Rights Coalition and we chair there the thematic group on national laws and policies. And we are working in a very, very intensively on resisting this anti-gender slash anti-trans wave that is affecting uh, all our movements um, everywhere. And it's becoming a new area, like an area in, in itself. We have a transversal area focused on socioeconomic justice. And one extra area that is also the area that I'm coordinating that is focused on depathologization. And by that, like the pathologization is the, the movement and also the, the goal to remove all um, pathologizing categories like gender dysphoria, for example, or disorders uh, of sex development that currently are stigmatizing and, and putting transgender diverse and intersex people in an inferior position when compared, for example, to cisgender people and to endosex people. And we started this work into, you know, back in 2010. And a key goal for GATE uh, was to remove pathologizing categories from the, the, the global classificatory system, which is the international classification of diseases. Um, but at the same time, which is, you know, was particularly focused on trans issues in the case of intersex issues, and we are still, you know, struggling with, with that. Uh, our goal is not only to remove pathologizing languages, but also to, to ban um, human rights violations in medical settings, including normalizing surgeries uh, imposed on, on intersex children. When we started doing this work, the SDGs were not in our uh, in our minds or the, the framework of development because something that happened, and we're still dealing with the consequences of this, something that happened with trans and diverse and intersex people is that uh, our allies and partners and even our enemies tend to think of us in silos. So if you said like women, it's gender, gay and lesbian people, sexual orientation, trans people, uh, is access to legal gender recognition, access to gender affirming treatment. Intersex people, no one really knows, but you have to put the eye. So, and we had, at the beginning, we have that, that frame and we started, you know, working on depathologization and our goal was to get rid of these uh, categories. 
But very soon, and especially, you know, when we started talking with, with activists and analyzing what was going, not only at the level of the World Health Organization, but also at the, at the national level, we saw the categories were used for um, purposes that had a strong impact in socioeconomic issues. So in the case of a category like gender dysphoria or disorder of, um, or transsexualism, for example, or gender identity disorder, we saw that, that those categories were used to allow people to change their gender markers. So we engage in something that we call legal depathologization, like promoting depathologization through legal reform. But there was another and very important use, which is that diagnoses were used to allow people to get access to gender affirming treatment. And of course, it has to do with psychomedical authority saying, yeah, you can have that surgery or yeah, you can have that, that uh, hormonal treatment. But it was something that we didn't thought at the, about at the beginning. And it was like the cornerstone, or cornerstone of the issue. It is that diagnoses were used for coverage. So it wasn't only about getting permission to modify our bodies. It was about getting those procedures covered in public health system, but especially in private health systems. And actually what we realized is that if we eliminated, um, if we eliminate all references to trans people, for example, in the international classification of diseases, well, what would happen is that some private insurance, for example, in the US or in other countries where the commodification of healthcare is extreme, will stop covering for the kind of procedures that trans people needed. That re realization put us in uh, the urgent need of working in the connection, uh, we, we started exploring what was going on, you know, and, and trying to pay attention, especially to SDG uh, three, but we realized that getting the diagnosis, which usually required to invest in getting a relationship with a therapist, sometimes paying out, out of pocket, or not getting the diagnosis and having to pay for procedures out of pocket, was making trans people poorer and poorer. So that pathologi pathologization had consequences in, in trans people's socioeconomic uh, situation. We also realized that in the case of trans people that had been subjected to processes of institutionalization and of, of extreme pathologization like conversion therapies, for example, um, and in the case of intersex people, that have been subjected to normalizing interventions, well, the consequences of these human rights violations in medical settings were also um, banning people for having access to education and actually to get access to decent jobs. And decent is like with a proper payment, it's like not like a moral. <laughs> So what we realized is that, and it's a very simple way of putting it, is that pathologization was making all our communities poorer and that socioeconomic uh, injustice and in, particularly, in particular poverty was a key issue that we needed to address. So from, from there and started like two years ago, we started, we have like limited resources to do that, but to work on the intersection between SDG one and SDG three. Another realization was uh, that even when there are better and better gender identity laws in different countries, and even when, um, yeah, I would say like, like gender identity laws are getting a little better and trans people are getting access to education and to certain uh, extent to employment, our communities keep being poor. And one of our goals right now is trying to see, like not only engaging with the SDG process, but uh, with the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, engaging with a UN agencies focused on socioeconomic issues, to see like how we can talk about trans people in general, but also some particular trans communities like trans women of color and trans sex workers as key populations in the international response to poverty. Because what is happening, again, with this reduction of trans people equal 
gender recognition is that we don't have the, the right indicators and the right frameworks to address the issue that even when recognition or communities keep being po uh, poor, they keep being harassed by the police, they keep being really low in rates of like access to employment, uh, it keep being illegal migrants or migrants in positions of not getting uh, healthcare coverage. So that's the, um, uh, the core of what we are, that we are, uh, and I know that this maybe it's a long distance between depathologization and poverty. Now, you know, what was usually what happened is that, oh, we should have known it better. It has been a long uh, process of discussion, including all the processes around the, um, uh, the elaboration of the LGTBI index. And, and we know that part of our role, and I apologize for that for colleagues before you know, stop talking. Part of my, my job in, in, in of my, my task in life is, is being a pain to everyone to say like, but what about trans people? And you know, and what about gender non-binary people? And what about intersex people? And what about, you know, just to make sure that, uh, and this is key for the work that the gate does, that we can have the right tools so one of the key, and we can talk about that later, one of the key challenges that we see is that uh, the, our movements are poor. So our communities are poor, our movements are poor, they're the same movements that need to carry out the work, or donors <laughs> times are, are poor, and it's extremely difficult to find out the right disaggregation, able to build the right kind of indicators that we need in order to challenge what people believe that they know about trans and intersex communities. So I will, uh, sorry if I took too much time. Well, Mar, you talked something that is very important and I think that connects with what everyone else said that when we talk about an intersectional approach, we're talking about the different realities and the different ways that our communities are marginalized, but we're also talking about an intersectional way of approaching the issues. So we within the LGBTI community have always had a very human rights -y focus. And throughout the years, we're learning there are other tools and other ways of reaching out and other, you know, I'm a lawyer. There are other ways that are not legal that we're supposed to approach things and do things. So that's something that we also are learning throughout the way. And I'm not gonna let you even drink any water or do anything and I'm gonna go back to you. So you can just go deeper on exactly what you said about being that purpose on your life of drinking, oh, look at you. You did get time yeah. to drink that yeah. water. Yeah. Um, so when we have that, the few spaces that we do have these kinds of conversations, we're very focused on cease populations. So can you give us a couple of tips and do that little push on how do we put trans and non-binary and intersex people on the center of the conversation? Oh, uh, that's a very difficult. <laughs> that's a very difficult question. I don't, and I don't have, like. I have many different. I have diff many different answers. And on a different day, probably what I would say is, yeah, you know, we need. Of course, we need more people involved, and we need uh, more activists. And which means that activists working on the ground, they need the the knowledge, and they need also the resources. So what? Um, in, in terms of, of when we say in terms of centering, or just, just I'm going to use an example. And a couple of years ago, I was invited to attend to a, a meeting focus on a process that GATE is, is part of around the universal healthcare coverage. Uh, it was a nice meeting full of nice, uh, nice people, but for an entire day, I was the only trans person there and was the only intersex person there. And I'm a very vocal person, but when I am alone, usually with people, these are all feminist warnings saying never be the only one in the room. Uh, you need other people, so your positions are not yours. If they're, they are positions held by a community. So it requires more participation, it requires more engagement, but also um, it can be equal uh, to invite someone at the country level, working at the country, country level to provide 
a testimony and then to have a Global North expert explaining the testimony. We need people from everywhere engaging at the international conversation in an educated way, which usually mean transferring resources so people can have the time to engage with these conversations. So in, in that sense, uh, we need within our movements and communities the same change that we want to see in the world, which is more people able to do the work that they love and that they know how to do. And to like, I really love the, the geopolitics of this conversation because it's not usual for me to be in a place where people have names that I can associate with Spanish and, and, and Portuguese. And, but for example, not having conversations or all conversations happening in English marginalized many activists in Brazil, in Latin America, and even in Spain and Portugal, and, Span and, and activists working you know, in Russian, or many activists working in Eastern Europe uh, and are you know, invited to always attend meetings with translation all in Russian, which creates like different levels of exclusion. So how to center, it's basically including. But I will say that that would be, that's my, my general an answer. The, the more specific one is right now we are seeing due to anti-gender organizing and especially on, on anti-trans on anti uh, movements that trans people's human rights, uh, or obviously the other way around, that women's rights are incompatible with trans people's rights. And, and that division, which is, at least from our perspective, it's not even about women or, or trans people, it's, a, it's about anti-rights, anti-democracy, and, and it's dividing, as you said, Luisa, the, the, like the progressive uh, alliances uh, and making people that have worked together forever on pushing you know our agenda together to to have fights internally um so i would push for the for those for centering uh trans intersex gender diverse voices and also for finding commonalities saying you know we're all together on this we all have the same interest in sexual and reproductive rights, in ensuring you know that there are not human rights violations in medical settings, we struggle for socioeconomic justice for all, and try to renown each other. Uh, so usually, I will advocate for disaggregation. Right now, <laughs> I am advocating for aggregation. We need we need like more nuanced conversations on on what's. On what's going on right now and what are going to be the consequences from our perspective everyone is losing uh, in his you know internal divisions among communities thank, thank you for thank giving you. the opportunity of sharing sharing this no thank you so much mara and i just want to say to everyone if you want to ask questions to use the q a and i want to use this hook that Mario left us to call Almudena, because I don't know if everyone knows it, but the LGBTI stakeholder group, we consider ourselves the younger sibling of the women's major group, because they welcomed us before we were an actual recognized stakeholder group and we participated on everything together. So I want to ask Almudena, um, can you tell us a little bit about the intersectionality focus of the women's major group and how you think we can work together better? Yeah, of course. Um, we are happy to be in collaboration with groups working on these issues. I think speaking from one voice against all system of operations, at the same time, understanding that we have our differences and listening and understanding this difference is crucial to our groups. No? But now I, 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 I would like to move to, to the point that Mauro was talking um, before. No? that we need to work together more than ever because gender equality movement and the LGBTQ plus movement are the first line of attack of anti-gender movements nowadays, not the gender equality movement and LGBTQ plus movement. We are under attack of conservative and authoritarian states, right wing, far right and fascist parties united with fundamentalist groups also with the economic sector, and also in many cases supported by parties and social movements considered progressive. So we are in front of a, of a global and transnational phenomenon 
that is linked to racism, xenophobia, neocolonialism, white supremacy, and the attack on women's sexual and reproductive rights and LGBTQ plus people with a special virulence and aggression against transgender people. It is therefore an inter intersectional phenomenon in which very diverse and different groups unite around a shared consensus with, with a clear ultimate goal that is no one other than to maintain the neoliberal capitalism. Um, these groups want to back, um, go back to the natural order of the societies through the defense of the traditional heteropatriarchal family, the defense of the heteronormativity, religious freedom, a state sovereignty over, over the multilateral system. Um, and we can see, you know, it's very obviously, we can see that there's, there's a direct relationship between far right, fascist movements, fundamentalist groups, and attacks on the sexual and reproductive rights of women and LGBTQ plus people. Clear examples of these attacks, you know, all of you know the attacks on the Istanbul Convention in Europe, uh, the attempts to absolutely ban the right to abortion in Poland, the declarate free sons of LGBTQ plus people in Poland also, or, or, or for instance, the attempt to eliminate gender and feminist studies from universities in Hungary, and obviously the attack on transgender people around the world with a special emphasis in my country, in Spain, so, sorry, but it's true, and also in Europe. Um, so because all of this, we need to work together. We need to share our agendas. We need to share our strategies. We need to share our spaces and processes. So transnational solidarity and cross-constituency solidarity is our best bet for a better future. So um, this is, <laughs> I stop here and we can talk later about it. That Thank was you. very beautiful words mm. and a very beautiful call, Amadana. Thank you so much. And mm. in order to be able to do all this that we're talking, we need to oxygenate spaces and to bring youth voices mm. and the new generations to this conversation. So I'm going to call on Chris to tell us a little bit about how do you see LGBTI youth engagement in this development spaces and connecting to everything that we've been talking here? Definitely. Um, so just going on what the conversation has been focusing on, on, on the idea of cross movement solidarity and also on the idea of infighting, I would say that uh, a lot of the reason why we often have infighting within the, the different gender movements, whether that is the feminist movement and the LGBTI movement or within uh, the LGBTI community, has a lot to do with assimilate, assimilation politics that have been very prevalent in both communities. In having appealing uh, to getting rights and getting freedom by appealing to systems of oppression and to being second place in these systems of oppression while at the same time keeping a certain level of privilege. Of privileges. This has been very prevalent in certain parts of the, of the LGBTI community. I think it's very important that as a, as a general movement, we start, like especially with the younger generations, we start relegating against it. And we start uh, denying that this is actual freedom or actual, um, e actual equality. It is actually just a form of assimilation within the patriarchy. And that is something we should abolish. We should abolish the, the system at the high level. So, in that sense, I feel like the development uh, framework has a lot of different ways in which the UN has been complicit to all these systems that Amulena has uh, has helped us like really pinpoint. Like it has been complicit to capitalism. The examples has to do with SG5, in which SG5 uh, keeps um, certain. Uh, patriarchal notions of what is gender on, on extreme binarism, or it holds a lot of its roots of its uh, objectives on certain treaties at the UN that are actually not that well designed specifically for LGBTQ people and that were designed 
to be vague on purpose by activists in order to actually get somewhere in the text because it was being blocked. And we keep seeing this, right, at the UN. We keep seeing young people, well, sorry, LGBTQ people be scapegoated uh, by, by different um, nation states that do not have uh, our rights in their interests. And we also see them being blocked. So for example, we don't have an official human rights treaty, even though it's been a fight that's been ongoing. And it's, it seems like it's not going to be going there soon. So we have to focus on the different kind of intersections within the actual uh, frameworks that we have. And in that sense, the development framework of the SDGs also has a lot of weaknesses that we can focus on tweaking and that we can focus on improving coming the next uh, generation of the development framework. So that's kind of the, the spot that we looked at when we started creating Another constituency that I didn't uh, talk about on my last intervention, because I think it was very important to, to give more a greater background and the reason why it's, it is so needed. So within the LGBTI stakeholder group and within uh, the major group for children and youth, which are both um, major groups within the United Nations that engage uh, different processes, and especially both of them have been very uh, loud at, at different uh, events, like the, the HOPF, and especially the MGCY has like a really long history, like it's been there since the start of the major groups, we try to look at where we could find a point for systemic change and we could find a, a leverage point to, to accelerate that systemic change. So when I was thinking about it, I was, I was seeing all of the resources that both groups had, especially the LGBTI stakeholder group had, and noticed that there were a lot of, uh, a lot of activists that had a lot of passion for it, but not all were young. And oftentimes it is young people that bring in creative ideas and like bring in also a lot of energy that is needed to, that is needed for movements in general. And a lot of also perspectives that are not, um, that are willing to say things as they are, that are willing to denounce uh, the complicitness of the United Nations, that are willing to also criticize and hold themselves accountable. And I feel like the younger generation specifically uh, different movements, and I'm talking about the climate movement because that is my experience, but I think it's across the board, have a really nice ability and really nice internal mechanisms to maintain themselves accountable and to criticize each other and also improve together. And I think that that was something that maybe we were, we were missing in the entire conversation of LGBTQI people at the United Nations. So that was uh, where we started this constituency that is still in its formation processes and is still in its official, officialization, but it's a, in my eyes, I see it as a really important uh, leverage point where a lot of different stakeholders and a lot of different mechanisms meet. And if you can push it enough, perhaps we can get systemic change across the UN system and get more queer language and get actual policy uh, for queer people and for our liberation against the future. So, yeah. Thank you, Chris. Um... I'm gonna give a shout out to Chris because a lot of you don't know, but I know because I work with Chris as our interim youth representative and Chris has been doing a lot of work to bring new voices to these spaces so we can hear new people saying different things and not the same people saying the same things all the time. And also creating this way that those of us who have been here longer and everyone else who has been here a lot longer than me can give a lot of advice and work together with this oxygenation of the new voices so that we don't have to have the same people doing things and we all can retire at some point from our work and have the youth doing a lot of the things when they're not as much youth as they are right now. Um, and I also, and I wanna call Boya on, on everything that has been said here. We know, and you talked to us in the beginning of the amazing work that UNDP has been doing to include LGBTI populations. And I wanted you to jump in and tell us a little bit on some entry points for civil society, what you see as advances, what you see about like barriers that we see along the way on engaging on LGBTI issues and development within the UN space. Thank you very much. And uh, it's uh, amazing to hear uh, such valuable thoughts from um, all the panelists. Um, I'm really grateful. I'm also grateful for the criticism. And I will have to agree that in uh, many cases, uh, the UN system leaves people behind and uh, leaves uh, LGBTIQ plus people behind um, or does not include uh, people enough in 
enabling processes that are happening. This is changing. It is changing, but it is changing very slowly. So um, I understand the impatience. I understand um, the willingness to do more, to do things faster. But you also have to acknowledge that it is uh, historically a very slow system. It's a multilateral organization. A lot depends on member states. So I would say it's actually quite amazing to see how LGBTI or LGBTIQ advocates, how professional uh, they have become in interacting with the UN and that the expectations are more realistic, the efforts are more targeted and uh, there is a lot of success and the very existence of this uh, stakeholder group is a huge success. And the fact that countries are providing information on LGBTI people, not SOGI, not SOGI-esque, uh, in the VNRs uh, is, is also VNRs for people who don't follow the process of the voluntary national reviews uh, that are being provided um, uh, at a high level uh, forum on sustainable development on how countries progress vis-a-vis uh, -vis various SDGs. That's, that's, that's quite remarkable. What I can tell you is that it is likely that there will be a more coherent approach in UN entities um, on doing uh, LGBTIQ plus work. Um, and uh, there's also going to be, uh, hopefully in the near future, um, more accountable, um, a system of accountability uh, in the UN entities because um, UN entities are not inclusive enough. Uh, LGBTIQ people are uh, clearly underrepresented also. There are very few people who are at leading positions, managerial positions, and this is also in the process of changing. Um, a few years ago, um, I was uh, the only person at UNDP um, um, who had uh, LGBTI on, on their business card. This is no longer the case. Um, as you know, also UN Women now, they have a dedicated officer, um, Sophie Brown, who's, who's, who's doing only only this work. This is, this is quite amazing. It is happening. Uh, but as I said, with a very slow pace. And we do need your constructive criticism and um, to be pointed out, as, as, as Mauro said, uh, when we do things wrong. And Mauro, please be, uh, be a pain, please bug us, please uh, criticize us. You actually helped us a lot a few years ago. Uh, at UNDP, we, 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 we uh, included something in the report that was, that was wrong. And uh, Mauro and uh, Morgan Carpenter came and we organized a webinar for all UN, UN entities uh, in English and in Spanish, so that it's not only in English, um, about what, what are the uh, human rights challenges experienced by intersex people. And uh, since then, we also watch very closely publications to make sure that uh, this does not uh, happen again. So we are also learning. Um, and that's also very important to engage with um, your country offices, to engage with your regional hubs in the respective regions where, where you live um, and generate um, interest and uh, make yourself known, establish connections with these people. And uh, I'd be happy to facilitate this. Uh, I sit at headquarters, so obviously I can reach out to uh, my uh, uh, colleagues who are in the respective regions, and then they can channel their requ your request to respective country office. What I wanted to say is that usually we have a seeking agreement. So we agree with the member state on what to do in the country. So um, in many cases, um, if you want to do inclusion and rights related work uh, with LGBTI people, you have to be creative because it can be an um, environment that criminalizes uh, same-sex uh, relations that uh, somehow either criminalizes or in other way uh, punishes uh, trans people. Um, so there you have to use other opportunities. Uh, I have stopped counting what kind of various languages we use in order to, to promote such work. Sometimes it's coded. Uh, I often see men at risk 
what 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 is this like men who are jumping with parachutes and the parachutes don't open no um so that requires a little bit of patience and a little bit of understanding that we can not always be straightforward you have to find the way how to how to engage and that's why hiv is so important because in many cases there is a significant overlap i'm not saying that it is a 100 percent overlap but significant overlap and access to healthcare, uh, addressing stigma and discrimination, human rights violations, they are uh, important. And through this HIV portfolio, they can actually, um, certain positive outcomes can be, can be achieved, or at least we can try. But the other thing is that um, we engage when there is a request. I cannot parachute myself in country X and say, hey, country X, change your law. It's not going to work because these are sovereign states and that's not the mandate of, of, of the UN. But if country X, so if advocates advocate, let's say, with the Ministry of Health or the Ministry of Youth or the National Human Rights Institution, um, and there is a request to UNDP, hey, advise us on what would be the health and human rights implications of legislation Y, um, then we can engage and we can start a dialogue and we can bring people on board. And then if uh, someone asks who invited you, we can say, well, they did. And that's that's how it works. So I think the most important thing is to, to realize that um, there has to be a request. There has to be a partnership with the country offices and regional offices. So you have to build a relationship and you have to be creative in finding ways to engage. And uh, if you see um, um, behavior that is uh, homophobic, transphobic um, from UN staff, and more specifically UNDP, you should actually report them. That is not acceptable. So it's not our policies prohibit this explicitly. And also, if you see uh, UNDP entities contracting with organizations that discriminate based on sexual or, uh, orientation and gender identity, you should raise the issue as well, because our policies also do not allow us to contract with such organizations. So um, these are few, um, I would say, practical advices and uh, I can tell that people are following the High Level Political Forum, which is an excellent opportunity for engagement as well at the global level. Um, and uh, I don't think I can add much on this one. You know it better than I do. So thank you very much. I want to thank all our panelists, and I do realize we are at the hour, but I do want to give all of you 30 seconds. I know that's really hard. It's hard for me to speak for only 30 seconds, but we're going to try to make it to not not address the questions because we have very interesting questions on how to support queer communities of color, on how to work in spaces where criminalization still exists. How do we talk on, with anti-rights states and movements who say trans women are not women? We have very important questions that we won't have time to address, but I want to give everyone 30 seconds to say final words, maybe approach something on, on the questions or maybe you've heard something that was said by the other panelists and I'm going to be I'm not super strict, but I'm going to try to be super strict and give you 30 seconds to say your final words. Um, Boya, would you like to start? Be, uh, be very cautious. The first principle should be do no harm. Sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, it is not the right time or this is not the right activity for this time. So always think uh, before before you act and um, engage strategically. Thank you. Thank you, Boya and Chris. Yeah, I think my final words would have to be that um, us four panelists and like speaking more for myself, we don't have all the answers. And that is one of the, the key points of uh, why creating movements and why creating communities is so important because people together can create answers that none of them individually have. So if you want to join us at the Queer Youth Constituency, if you want to join the LGBTI stakeholder group, that is incredibly valuable. And connecting people 
the resources at the UN and the knowledge that these actors have to the people that do the grassroots work and to the people that are like fighting directly for systems like on the ground is so, so important. So creating this community is one of the objectives that we should be striving for. More connection, more um, exchange, and with that, I guess, more answers, more solutions. Thank you, Chris. Mauro, I see that you got another panelist there with you, but you're 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Florida is here, just, just waiting for going up. Um, I would say to people that get questions about what trans people are, what trans women are, are please don't engage in debunking. It's like, you know, having an argument with, uh, with people that are really are not interested in finding the, the answer. For us, the answer is like women, like men and non-binary, like binary people, we are all diverse. We have all different backgrounds and it's not about definition, uh, what people, what people are just working together to defending uh, rights. Remember that anti-trans rhetoric is extremely similar to racist and anti-migrant rhetoric. This idea like, oh, someone doesn't look like, like me. It's a different body, different color of skin, different language, and then it's dangerous. And that's, these are not the kind of discussions that we need to have to promote and defend human rights. Uh, there are, um, if people, want to contact us you can I can write my my address and we can keep talking about about this but please don't waste your time uh, engaging with with fanatics this yeah wait of time thank you Mara Almudena your 30 seconds to end this okay very quickly so uh, I just would like to repeat that the message that we need to work together we need to convince to the rest of the social movements about our demands and our visions. And that all of us, we are working also for the social justice and for democracies. So, and that's all. And always repeating the same message that we need to work together always. Yeah, okay, thank you, Luisa. I just want to thank everyone who stayed this five extra minutes, including our amazing panelists. I could have not had a better panel than this one. I'm so happy to work with all of you. And I want to work with all of you together in all these different spaces with the women's major group, with the children, yeah. and with the UN agencies and everything. And I'm so happy that you all could be here. And thank you for everyone who attended today. As Chris said, join the LGBTI stakeholder group, go check out the women's major group, go check out GATE, go check out the UNDP index that Voya said is gonna start um, being prototyped this year. So we're very excited about it. Um, and please reach out and continue to work together on this because this is a very important topic that we wanna continue talking about and doing a lot of work together. Thank you everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your week. <laughs>